five environmental problems we fix in America. Because of how our media systems are set up, you're primarily going to hear about bad news. Sadness and anger both drive more clicks than joy and even huge media companies want to get their engagement up. While it is important to know what's broken, my previous video with Ellen Kelsey covered the importance of also knowing what's working. If we hyper fixate on what's going wrong, we miss out on all the things that will help us bring us forward. So let's talk about five examples that we actually managed to fix here in the United States. My name is Isaiah Hernandez and this is Queer Brown Vegan, a platform to bring you environmental education that's focusing on intersectional issues rather than ignoring them. If you like what you see here, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe because it helps grow my channel and bring you more educational content. Number one, in the summer of 1943, residents of Los Angeles couldn't see more than three blocks ahead of them. The cause? Toxic smog filling the air. People felt their eyes and lungs were burning, but it was blamed on a nearby plant. However, the plant shut down and the smog stayed. This was a wake-up call. By the 1950s, it became apparent that cars were the problem. Dr. R. Hagen Smith was the researcher who found how exhaust contributed to smog, and his findings went on to become the foundation for America's clean air legislation. Change can move slowly, but by 1966, California became the first state to have a tailpipe pipe emission standards, and during the 1960s we also saw the passing of the Federal Clean Air Act and provided that allowed California to have stricter than federal regulations. In 1975, the US was the first country to mandate catalytic converters, which helps clean emissions. And by the 1980s and 1990s, California had the cleanest cars in the world which maybe isn't saying much since cars still pollute, but it beats going outside and seeing nothing but smog all around. Emission levels are 99% cleaner than those levels, and the California Air Resources Board still exists to this day. Make sure our efforts to end air pollution don't end here. And as someone who grew up in California, I am very privileged to have lived both in Los Angeles and in the Bay Area during my younger years and recognizing that we actually have a lot of climate goals implemented and we are trying our best to continue showcasing that for other states. Number two. In the 1950s, acid rain plagued the Midwest and eastern states. Coal plants in the Midwest spewed pollutants into the air, making the chemical clouds in the rain acidic. This brought harm to the soils and plants, it poisoned lakes and fish and birds. It just ultimately was not a great time for anyone. During the 1980s, it was considered to be one of the largest environmental threats. The first regulations appeared in the Clean Air Act, which we mentioned in our previous solution, and it helped reduce the acidic emissions, but these regulations had to be strengthened even more in the 1990s. This actually still is an issue we see today. Long-term ecological research sites, or LTERs, have found that the increasing CO2 in the atmosphere is having a similarly harmful effect on things like forest ecosystems. However, the important thing to note here is that by the 2000s, thanks to regulations and cooperation, sulfate denitrate levels in rain had decreased by around 40%. The problem's not completely solved, but at least we got some sort of handle on that. And imagine if acid rain was falling on you right now. Would you be burned alive? Number three, this one is still a problem, but there are some big changes. For many of us, we know about Rachel Carson who produced her work, Silent Spring. People in the US were mostly blind to their environment. Chemical pesticides, particularly DDT, were sprayed freely, and no one thought that these chemicals would also kill birds that feed on dead or dying insects. No one really thought about how chemicals travel through food chains, or that they could accumulate and cause medical problems later on to be passed from mothers to their children. These were new ideas to Americans in the 1960s, and Silent Spring made it clear that life is much more interconnected than people thought. Carson herself didn't call for a ban on these chemicals, but urged caution. While the nation reacted, even though some responded negatively, with one chemist publishing their own review titled Silence Miss Carson, which is so messed up, the change was already on its way. DDT was banned domestically by 1972, and the US government founded the Environmental Protection Agency in the year following as well. Now, the entire field of the chemistry evolved into green chemistry and the research for biologically and ecologically sound solutions. Not only did this book influence policy around pesticides, which still have a long way to go, but it changed our cultural idea of a limitless earth able to sustain whatever we wish. Here we are 60 years later and still waking up to this idea, but this was a significant step forward and let us not forget that past.
Number four, in 1969, the Cayuga River in Cleveland, Ohio caught on fire for the 13th time. It was one of the most polluted riverways in all of the United States. Not a single fish could be caught in that river, and its unique location and proximity to Lake Erie and connection between the north and the south had made it a target for industrialists. The river became a popular dumping place and transported waste and sewage from the rapidly industrialized cities. It burned for the first time in the early 1868. The fire in 1969 that led to national spotlight was not the most severe, only lasting for about 24 minutes, but the story got published in Time Magazine. Following an oil spill in California, this Time article helped create a rallying cry to clean up America's waterways. In the years following, we saw the Water Quality Improvement Act of 1970, the Clean Water Act of 1972, and the Great Lake Quality Agreement and the creation of state and federal environmental protection agencies. Finally, in 1998, the river was designated as an American Heritage River. Today, more than 70 species can be found today in the Cayuga River, and in 2019, Ohio's EPA declared the fish were safe to eat. How amazing is that? Maybe not for the fish, but for the ecosystem. Number five, what are some things that come to mind when you think of the United States? And I know a lot of us have thoughts about that, maybe beer or football, but what about a bird? Rachel Carson's Silent Spring influenced the American identity in so many ways in one of those behind the threat that DDT presented as with the bald eagles. Seeing our national symbol was at risk for helping mobilize Congress to also pass the Endangered Species Act. This was a huge for plants and animals that were at the serious risk for extinction. It requires federal agencies to prepare recovery plans and guarantee these species rebound and eventually get taken off the list and lose their endangered status. 99% of all species protection under this act have managed to stay alive today, including the bald eagle, grizzly bears, humpback whales, and the American peregrine falcon. The ripple effects of this are critical as well, with examples like the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone showcasing how the well-being of one species can be critical for the well-being of an entire ecosystem. So there you have it. Many of these challenges still exist in new forms today, and there is a lot farther that we need to go, but we owe it to ourselves to look at it and the work that's already happened. We aren't alone and we're creating change now, just like we're creating change decades ago. There will be similar support if it comes from generations after us, but helping our society transition in something equitable and sustainable and putting it to our outdated and harmful beliefs is an intergenerational, intercultural challenge, but that the work has already started. And this is what allows my environmental work to continue staying is that when people ask me, how do I have hope? It's not that I have hope, it's the fact that there has been so many decades of other leaders who have come before me in history that continue to pave the way until they took their last breath of life. And that's how I want to continue managing myself in this world. Thanks for watching and be sure to like the video and leave a comment with something you learned or topics you'd like for me to explore and subscribe to the channel if you like what you saw.